Today we're going to talk about uh, Unit 43 air source uh, heat pumps. We'll be talking about water source and other types of heat pumps in the following lesson, but not today. Verse cycle refrigeration. The best way to describe a heat pump is basically uh, the uh, cycle operating in reverse. The heat pumps are refrigeration systems that can pump the heat two ways, into and out of a structure. Cooling only air conditioning systems can only pump heat in one direction. You must have a four-way reversing valve in order to make this happen. It is used to switch the unit between heating and cooling modes of operation. Heat sources for winter. Air conditioners pump heat from low temperature inside the structure to the high temperature outside the house. At zero degrees outside air temperature, there's still 85% usable heat in the air. The heat pump removes heat from the outside air in the winter and deposits it into the conditioned space to heat it. Air to air heat pump design. The four-way reversing valve. This thing can be a little bit complicated. We'll hope, hopefully take some of the mystery out of it uh, as we get into this lesson. Allows the heat pump to pump heat in two directions. Diverts the heat laden uh, discharge gas to either uh, heat or cool in the con to the condition of space. Discharge gas is directed from the compressor to the indoor coil in the heating mode. Discharge gas is directed from the compressor to the outdoor coil in the cooling mode. Now notice that we do not refer to the outdoor unit as a condensing unit. We refer to it as the outdoor unit and we refer to the air handler as the indoor unit. Four-way reversing valve control and operation. Controlled by the space temperature thermostat, a four-ported uh, valve with a slide mechanism uh, located internally. Uh, the position of the slide determines the mode of the operation, either in heating or in cooling. Smaller systems utilize smaller direct acting four-way reverse valves. Larger systems use a pilot operated reversing valve that use the high pressure in order to push the slide. In this picture here, we're showing the four-way reverse cycling, excuse me, the reversing valve in the winter cycle. Here we have the indoor uh, hand, uh, air handler. Notice that we're calling it a condenser because we're giving up the heat that was extracted from the outside. Return air at 70 degrees. You have 80 degree air coming out of this thing. Uh, one of the limitations of heat pumps is people, especially older people with uh, circulation issues, say that the temperature of the heat pump is not as high as a gas furnace. That is a correct statement. Typically, on a heat pump, we are going to see uh, outlet temperatures around 100 degrees, 110. Whereas on a gas furnace, you can get all the way up to 130 degrees. But you will not see those really high temperatures on a heat pump. Evaporator will absorb the heat from the outside. Remember, this now is called an outdoor unit, not a condensing unit. So if the air is zero degrees out here, what you're saying, well, Larry, how can it have any heat if it's zero degrees outside? I believe there's a study, and I can't really cite the source, that basically says that you, there's heat in the air up to minus uh, 430 or some, some crazy very low temperature. Of course, at that point, there isn't a lot of heat, but there is some. So anyways, uh, in the wintertime, we're going to be pulling the heat out of the outside surrounding air on this outdoor unit, and we're going to uh, reject it into the air handler and, of course, into the uh, ductwork. Now in the summer, it's a little bit different. We are extracting the heat, which now is about 75 degrees inside the structure. We have a metering device over here. Of course, you have your refrigerant lines. And um, the supply air coming off the evaporator coil should be 55. Remember, air conditioning mode, all coils are designed for 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, 
So basically, you still have your large uh, uh, vapor line and you still have your small liquid line. And then, of course, you have the outdoor unit here. And we have air, in this case, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And basically, if we take 95 in, we should see at least 10 degrees difference uh, leaving this thing. So an air-to-air -air heat pump moves heat from the inside of the structure to the outside, very similar to air conditioning. Now, this is a four-way reversing valve slide mechanism. So basically, you notice right here, uh, in this position here, the slide is internal, basically connecting up to the outdoor coil, section line of the compressor. And then this line is connected to the indoor coil. Okay, so uh, in figure A, uh, position of the slide when the solenoid is de-energized. Now this uh, four-way valve is either going to be energized or de-energized depending on the manufacturer. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all um, uh, operating scenario uh, amongst all the manufacturers in the United States and for that matter uh, other countries that manufacture uh, heat pumps. So in this case here, depending on if the uh, uh, solenoids energized in position A uh, is de-energized. Basically, uh, we are going to uh, uh, show what happens to the refrigerant uh, when it goes, in this case here. So we have refrigerant that's connected to the indoor coil, suction line, and outdoor coil. Now notice here, the uh, in this position, the connected, uh, uh, connection to the outdoor coil has been uh, moved over to the suction line connected to the indoor coil. Discharge from the compressor never changes. Discharge air from the uh, compressor always goes in the center port by itself. I might add, when you take and put these, uh, uh, if you replace these uh, four-way reversing valves, it's a very hard job. It's a tedious job. It has to be accurate. You cannot overheat these valves. They're extremely very, very sensitive. Air-to-air -air heat pump resembles the central air conditioning uh, uh, system. The terminology, remember the evaporator has now been replaced with the indoor unit, is the evaporator. Outdoor unit is the condenser. Coils are called indoor-outdoor coil. Mode determines by, uh, by the direction of which the refrigerant flows. Air-to-air -air heat pump heating mode. In the heating mode, the uh, high pressure, uh, the high pressure hot gas from the compressor is directed to be pushed uh, the main valve slide over to the left. This uh, this directs the hot gas from the compressor into the indoor coil, okay, to provide space heating. Notice that the solenoid is de-energized. So in this particular case, uh, no power to the solenoid basically will, uh, in this position, allow uh, this unit to operate as uh, in the heat mode. So basically, you're coming in from the outdoor coil into the compressor. And then, of course, we go uh, directly uh, to the uh, indoor coil. So the hot gas here, if you'll notice, the hot gas here uh, will go through this uh, solenoid uh, activating mechanism and direct that uh, hot gas off of the discharge side of the compressor directly into the indoor coil where it will condense because we will assume that the indoor temperature is low enough that heat is required uh, based on the thermostat. Okay, uh, the air-to-air -air heat pump in the cooling mode, a little bit different. Uh, basically, in the cooling mode, the high-pressure hot gas from the compressor is directed to push the main valve slide to the right. This directs the hot gas from the compressor to the outdoor coil. Notice that the solenoid is energized. So in this case, the solenoid is energized. So what's going to happen here when this solenoid is energized, basically, uh, we are going to have uh, low pressure 
uh, uh, suction vapor going from the indoor coil into here. And basically, uh, we're going to operate as an air conditioning uh, split system would, op would operate. But remember, the key difference here is the solenoid is energized. And by the way, just for uh, uh, just so you're aware, whenever you wire up a uh, heat pump, you need more wiring in the low voltage side to make this thing happen. And what I mean by that, you have an additional terminal selection, either O or B. And uh, typically on a um, split system heat pump or even on a package system uh, heat pump, uh, I always put in about uh, a minimum of eight conductor uh, number 18 wire. We need a lot of wires. We'll explain the functions of these different wires in a heat pump operation uh, shortly. Refrigerant line identification. The large line is always the gas line because it always carries gas. Uh, it does not carry liquid. Functions as a suction line in the cooling mode and the discharge line in the heating mode. The smaller line is the liquid line only because liquid refrigerant travels through it. The liquid flows to the inside in the summertime and to the outside in the winter. That's basically the only difference. Here we have a split system heat pump. So of course you have your electrical disconnect to take and isolate power to the uh, outdoor unit. Uh, one of the things that you have to really be careful of right here, where I'm pouring, putting my uh, um, uh, mouse arrow right here, is the uh, these uh, outdoor units, depending on if you have snow or ice cold, you just can't put these things on a slab four inches above the uh, ground uh, ex it, with certain exceptions. The reason why I say this is in the, as, an, as an example, let's say you put one of these things in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, where you can typically get a foot of snow or more on the ground in the wintertime. Well, if the snow is allowed to accumulate, accumulate around the outdoor unit, it really blocks the coil uh, so that you're not able to utilize that um, coil surface in order for this thing to function as an evaporator. Basically, you're blocking it, okay? So, you need to check with your weather, weather systems uh, data sheet issued by the National Weather Service uh, to determine if you have a snow issue that you have to deal with, and this uh, outdoor unit has to be elevated as a result. Notice that we have spacing. Uh, we want a sufficient space from the building, minimum one foot and six inches. Um, up here, this looks like a conventional uh, forced air system, which it technically is. Here's your filter. And of course, then you have your indoor coil, you have your disconnect, you have your uh, supply ducting return, plus your filter, condensate pan, primary condensate drain, this pretty much looks the same as a split system gas uh, gas electric uh, um, that you would find in houses around here primarily. So the only thing that you're going to notice that on the furnace section, you don't have a burner section, you don't have a gas connection, you don't have a flue pipe. So there's the advantage. Metering devices are specially designed for the heat pump applications. They must be a metering device at the outdoor unit in the heating mode. Then there must be a metering device in the indoor unit in the cooling mode. We have to have a minimum two metering devices because of the fact we're reversing the flow. Now, typically, depending on the manufacturer, the check valves will be part of the equation as far as uh, how uh, the refrigerant is going to either be blocked or allowed to go through the uh, metering device depending on what it is calling for. Okay, thermostatic expansion valve, heating versus cooling. Okay, in figure A in the heating mode, basically we have uh, high pressure, high temperature gas going through the indoor coil at this point. And in here we have the TXV here. Notice that we have a check valve, which I talked about just previously. Check valve uh, opens to allow high pressure refrigerant to bypass the TXV. So in this mode, we're gonna utilize the check valve to uh, bypass this uh, metering device out here. This is the indoor air handler. Here's a return, here's the supply. 
Now we go a little bit different in B in the cooling mode. Now it becomes a different situation. We have liquid refrigerant going directly into the TXV because the check valve blocks the flow of refrigerant to bypass the TXV in the cooling mode, allowing the refrigerant to create a low pressure uh, liquid vapor state. Of course, go to the indoor coil, pick up heat inside, and then come out as a, um, uh, in this case, come out as a liquid. Okay, so basically in the cooling mode, high pressure liquid refrigerant is directed through the metering device because the check valve will be in a closed position. So in order for the metering devices to work on a heat pump split system or package in for that matter, you must have check valves as part of the equation. Capillary tube. Often encounter on older pieces of equipment. I really doubt if you're going to see one of these. I haven't seen a cap tube heat pump system in quite a while. Allows the refrigerant to flow in either direction. Typically, two capillary tubes are used. Different sizes for one for cooling and for heating modes. Check valves are used to reverse flow. You will not see these in present day uh, heat pumps. Electronic expansion valves, you'll definitely see these a lot. Many splits, a lot of them are designed. In fact, most of them are designed as heat pumps. Commonly found on new heat pump systems, a single EEV, electronic uh, expansion valves used for a close coupled unit with the indoor coil close to the outdoor unit, modulates the refrigerant flow in either direction, maintains the correct superheat at the compressor's common suction line in both heating and in cooling modes. Orifice metering devices, very common. Com combine, uh, it's a combination flow device and check valve in one. Referred to as a piston, allows the full flow in one direction and a restrictive flow in the other direction. Two are necessary with a split system heat pump. Uh, device at the indoor coil has a larger bore than the device at the outdoor coil. Please note, note that. When you're changing this out, you can't assume that the same orifice uh, piston is going to be on both the indoor and the outdoor. Check with the manufacturer's specifications. Summer cycle will use more refrigerant. Now, I haven't talked about this before, but heat pumps, depending on the design, the type, and the age, are considered critically charged systems. You can overcharge a heat pump. Uh, there's a little bit of forgiveness depending on the uh, piping design. Typically, heat pumps will have an accumulator on the suction line. Uh, and the reason is because the chance of having liquid carryover into the compressor is greater because the refrigerant is not going to be utilized uh, completely uh, in the heating mode. So typically, as a rule of thumb, and that's all this is, you're going to utilize about 65, maybe 70% of the refrigerant charge in the heating mode, whereas in the cooling mode, you're going to use 100% of that refrigerant. Combinations of metering devices, capillary tube as the indoor metering device for summer operation, check valve piped in parallel to allow flow in the other direction for winter operation. The outside unit may have a TXV with the check valve, utilizes a capillary tube only in the cooling mode. Efficient as a metering device for the summer, uses each device at its best. Liquid line accessories. Okay, one thing that's really, really, really important is liquid line filter dryers. The reason why I say that, liquid line filter dryers for heat pumps are different than a standard split system air conditioning design because the filter dryer is designed to allow refrigerant to flow in either direction. So when you put in a liquid line filter dryer on a modern 410A split system heat pump, that filter dryer has to be a bi-flow design has to be. If you put a single, uh, if you put a single direction by, uh, instead of a bi-flow design filter dryer, basically a molecular sieve uh, that's inside the uh, filter dryer will be allowed to uh, uh, deteriorate and start plugging up things inside the system. This is a very serious situation. So please, please, when you install a heat pump, make sure you have a uh, filter dryer, which is designed to flow in either direction. Now, the question has been asked in the past, can I use a biflow dryer on a just a split system air conditioner if I don't have a single uh, arrow, uh, single flow design 
uh, on a uh, air conditioning system? Sure, it's more expensive. So that being said, the biflow dryer is absolutely critical for the proper operation of the heat pump. Uh, whereas on an air conditioning split system or package unit, the flow of the refrigerant one direction is what we need to maintain. Uh, this is installed in series with a check valve on one uh, and one expansion valve. Same, same flow direction as the metering device. The biflow filter dryers allow the flow in either direction. It's basically two dryers within one shell. So when you work on heat pumps, when you're doing service work, compressor replacement, uh, valve replacement, you must have a biflow dryer. Please, please don't forget that. Liquid line accessories in the heating mode. Okay, so here we have the compressor. Notice that we have the low pressure vapor. Here is our four-way valve. Now, one thing that's common to the four-way valve is the compressor discharge line. That, okay, this part of the uh, piping system never, never changes. Please remember that. So you're going to have three connections on top, one connection on the bottom. The bottom connection is always reserved for the compressor. So it's pretty hard to mess that up. So when you're replacing one of these, that connection's easy. Now, could you mess up the connections on the other part? Yeah, you could if you weren't paying attention. And that's why it's very critical that you look at how the lines are attached, mark them, that kind of thing, just to make sure the replacement valve, if you replace one of these, is put in the correct position. So the refrigerant, of course, is coming from the uh, outdoor unit in a, uh, through the, uh, in the heating mode, basically, uh, remember the outdoor unit, instead of uh, putting, uh, taking heat out of the structure is actually taking heat from the outside air. And by taking the heat from the outside air, now what we're doing is we are um, taking this heat and uh, we are going to utilize that to take and heat the house. So here's our uh, filter dryer for cooling. Notice that we have a check valve, one, uh, one position only, a heating capillary type two. And then we go over here on the uh, indoor unit, we have another uh, metering device and a filter dryer right here. Notice that we have a check valve in the opposite position. And then we have capillary tube for our metering device here. I have a capillary tube here. So in this case here for heating, basically what is happening is the flow of uh, hot gas coming from the compressor in this mode is going to go through the house and heat the house up or the office, whatever it may be, as it uh, heats up the structure. This high pressure, high, uh, high temperature refrigerant uh, vapor will eventually become uh, liquid. And then of course, uh, what will happen as it becomes liquid goes through this uh, uh, capillary uh, slash, uh, it goes through this portion of the uh, heat pump cycle. And then of course goes outdoors where the heat in this case is absorbed from the condensing unit. Remember, you got to remember that you're going to reverse the flow of refrigerant for heating and cooling, depending on if the solenoid is energized or de-energized. Liquid line accessories in the cooling mode. Okay, basically now the outdoor unit functions like a normal air conditioning system would. Notice that the refrigerant flow is from the compressor discharge coming through this three-way valve through this port here. And of course, the uh, uh, refrigerant is going to be given up the heat that was absorbed by the indoor unit to the outside of the structure where it's less objectionable. And then of course, that refrigerant now becomes a high pressure, high temperature liquid through this uh, uh, metering device, the capillary tube. And then what happens here at this point uh, we, we've taken the path of least resistance because remember the flow of refrigerant in this particular case is going to hit a roadblock because this check valve is keeping this uh, filter dryer closed. It's going to go through the cooling capillary tube, which is our uh, metering device, into the evaporator where we're going to absorb heat from the return air and then of course bring that low pressure, low temperature vapor back to the uh, compressor. The application of air-to-air -air heat pumps. 
usually installed in milder climates. Uh, uh, they're very popular here in Southern California. They're extremely popular in Arizona. In a winter, the outdoor coil absorbs heat. If the outside temperature is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the refrigerant boils at approximately minus 15 degrees. Compressor and the system lose efficiency as the evaporator temperature drops. The system loses capacity as the outside temperature drops. So if you end up with a minus 30 degrees in winter time, I think I would very seriously question the installation of a heat pump system to heat the structure. Uh, because as the temp outside temperature drops, it's very inefficient as far as uh, supplying heat to the inside without utilizing a secondary source uh, or auxiliary heat. Auxiliary heat is required when the heat pump cannot provide heat uh, to a structure, uh, the heat to the structure needs. The heat pump is the primary source of heating. Auxiliary heat could be electric, oil, or gas. Electric heat is the most common auxiliary heat used. As the outside temperature drops, the structure requires more heat, and this would require the use of auxiliary heat, in this case, probably electric strip heaters. Balance point. This is kind of another issue that you have to learn in the heat pump uh, construction phase. It occurs when the heat pump can pump in exactly, can, excuse me, it occurs when the heat pump can pump at in exactly sorry can I call you back later Ah, uh, fine. Can you uh, make it really brief, please? No. Uh, around your pastor? Yeah, very possible. I would say the pastor probably the wrong part of the street heat. You're talking about the internet of the river, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I would check the rocket capacitor first. That could be long, because I would do that. That, that, that would uh, make the, uh, those problems right there. And then uh, uh, if the rocket capacitor is, uh, I would definitely look at replacing that, because that might be part of the problem. If that didn't solve it, that would be a problem for us to block that. It's kind of a lot of that. They are. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of one that's inside the control cabinet, and it would be a split one like a 5, 55, and I think 440 volts, yes. And it was on online. Uh, if you try to go to wholesale, also, I'll have to contact yourself. Another one. That means you need to get a service egg over there and return with uh, the uh, uh, acid and with the process of the fuel.
Well, you can call and see if they have a part time or something about there. You can get a part time or something. Yeah, that would be bad. We have a piece of the substitution. But a piece of the way that we would tell you that you gave it to me. They may sell to you. I don't know. It's an out of phase relationship, sir. Out of phase relationship. That would be a most of the question from a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's a All right, sorry, I had to take a phone call. Anyways, um, the balance point occurs when the heat pump can pump in exactly as much heat to the structure as leaking out. Above the balance point, the heat pump will cycle on and off. Below the balance point, the heat pump will run and run and run. Auxiliary heat will be energized. So basically, if the capacity of this unit has been exceeded, as an example, a real cold morning, let's say it's minus 10 degrees outside, the heat pump may not be able to extract enough heat out of the outdoor air in order for this thing to take and uh, pr provide enough uh, comfort heat to the inside of the structure. That being said, that being said, uh, then you have to have auxiliary strip heat come in in order to supplement the heat that would normally would come from the refrigeration cycle. So. Please understand that balance point is a critical part. This is usually done electronically on heat pumps. Coefficients of, coefficient of performance, COP. One watt of usable heat is supplied for each watt of energy purchased. 100% efficient uh, coefficient of performance, a COP of one to one. Uh, the output is the same as the input. Air-to-air -air, uh, heat pumps have a COP of 3.5 to 1, which is good. Uh, one watt of electrical energy is utilized, and the compressor can furnish 3.5 watts of usable heat. That's not a bad combination. You'll see what happens if you use strip heat. Okay, in this slide here, we have coefficient of performance, water-to-air heat pumps. Might not need auxiliary heat. A uh, water source uh, can be utilized, which is relatively constant temperature all winter. Heat loss and heat gain are nearly equal. The COP uh, rating, coefficient of performance rating, is as high as 4.1. Due to the temperature of the heat source, not the components of the equipment. Uh, very efficient for winter heating and summer cooling. The, tree, the key is to keep that water temperature consistent. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. Split type air-to-air -air heat pump, two styles, a split system. It has an indoor section, outdoor section. The package self-contained systems. A split system resembles a split system cooling air conditioning system. Uh, looks exactly uh, alike from the outside. The indoor unit is part of the system that circulates the air within the structure, contains the blower and the coil. Airflow pattern may be upflow, downflow, or horizontal. The refrigerant coil must be located in the airstream before the auxiliary heating coil. The indoor unit may be gas or oil, excuse me, the indoor unit may be a gas or oil furnace. 
the indoor unit furnace types. If it's a gas or oil furnace that's utilized in the indoor section, the coil must be located on the outlet's uh, airstream of the furnace. If the auxiliary heat is gas or oil furnace is used, the heat pump will not operate while they run. The heat pumps add to the electric furnace should have the coil located after the heat strips. Temperature of the conditioned air. The temperature is not as hot as with gas or oil fired equipment. I mentioned this earlier. If you have a heat pump, do not expect 130 degrees discharge temperature coming out of the grill uh, when it is uh, 40 degrees outside. Okay, leaving air temperature is in the 100 degree range. So as an example, let's say that you go outside, it's 48 degrees, and then on the inside, uh, you have the heat pump, the heat mode, you're going to probably supply just around 100 degree temperature. When I do temperature split checks on the heating mode, typically I would expect to see on the supply side about 100 degrees, not 120, not 130, like you would on a gas fired system or oil fired for that matter. The system's uh, COP drops if the airflow is restricted. This is a big deal. We'll talk more about this uh, uh, on heat pumps. Uh, it, they're very unforgiving if you have a, a restricted air supply, if you have inadequate returns. Air is introduced along the outside walls. A proper air distribution can reduce the draft complaints. Uh, probably one of the best systems as far as air distribution is concerned is what we call it, uh, what they call a perimeter ducting system where you have all the outlets along the outside walls of a structure. That being said, the return should be towards the center of the structure, either in the ceiling or low in the, towards the floor, depending on the design. This is a very good, it's a very efficient design. I've uh, had no issues with that going forward. Now, proper air distribution can reduce the draft complaints you could notice cold wall effect in cold weather. Uh, one of the things is with new houses, luckily they're constructed to be very, very tight as far as uh, the thermal effect is concerned. In other words, heat traveling through a wall. This is a very critical uh, aspect where old houses, you probably may not even have, depending on the location, uh, very little uh, insulation between the outside of the wall and the inside. So let's say you have a house that was built in 1969. As an example, you may have stucco on the outside, tar paper wire, of course, to hold the uh, stucco uh, integral to the outside. And then in between the two by four studs, you have nothing. Then on the inside, you have drywall. That airspace there is really a problem now because you have no way to cancel out all that radiation that is uh, heating up your walls on the outside. So what am I saying in all this? Your outside walls are critical in a house or an office building. Very, very critical. And if it's not insulated correctly, if it's not vapor tight, all the penetrations are properly sealed, you are going to have problems. I recall that I had a house in uh, Laverne, California a few years ago, uh, which I no longer live there now, but the bedroom wall was a westerly exposure. We had put in a double pane window. We put in an awning to take some of that extreme uh, solar gain on the afternoon sun. And that bedroom literally baked in the winter, in the uh, um, afternoon, especially in the summertime, early fall, which we are now moving into. And as a result, it was extremely hard to keep that room. We had to oversize the air conditioning for that reason alone, due to lack of insulation. The outdoor unit must have good air circulation around it. Discharge air must not be allowed to recirculate. Prevailing winds affect the performance. The outdoor coil should be installed so it's raised above the ground pad and to allow defrost water to run to the ground, okay? That's another reason why the unit needs to be off the ground so that the coil, when it's defrosting, the moisture on the outdoor coil is going to run off and into the ground. And of course, uh, 
that you know that we won't have an issue with water accumulating and possibly freezing up depending on the um, outside air temperature. Defrost system defrosts the ice from the outdoor coil. Temperature of the conditioned air sample installation. So looking at uh, figure 43.31, the heat pump installation shows a good method of distributing the warm air in the heating mode. Notice that we're using supply air on the perimeter system, basically the outside walls. The return is in the center, very good design. Upstairs, now the windows are here, 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 whoops, right there, and there. Notice again that the uh, uh, the, the uh, supply penetrations are towards the outside wall. Well, why not just have it in the center of the room? Well, you could, but see, here's the idea. Let's say that you have poor insulating qualities of these walls here. You want to take and cancel out the infiltration of these outside walls. That's why this air distribution system works great because you have the return in the center of the room supplies on the outside walls. Very good design. I did a heat pump installation in Port Orchard, Washington this summer that utilized this design right here and it worked very, very well. All right, air distribution system with the air being distributed from the inside utilizing high sidewall registers shows that the heat pump's 100 degree air is mixing with the room air of 75 degrees. So in this case here, we have a low return, 75 degrees going in, and then the air going through the uh, upflow system, and then we're distributing air uh, just basically inside towards the center at 100 degrees. So basically you're mixing. So what is happening here, uh, you, have, you have warm air coming here, but the problem is if you got a cold wall, Guess what? The guy that's sitting here by this outside wall here in the living room or dining room or whatever this happens to be is going to feel cold. So uh, one of the issues here is making sure that the ductwork is a position in a way that the occupants, if they have their uh, furniture set towards the outside walls, they are going to be able to do what? They're going to be able to be comfortable uh, uh, basically in the winter time by the proper distribution of this uh, heated air, in this case the uh, heat that was extracted from the outside air, and this customer is not going to have to put on a jacket or a sweater. So uh, anyways, what we're seeing here is 100 degree air mixing with the room air of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Package air to air heat pumps. I have all the sealed system, electrical components, and one housing. In other words, it's like a uh, package unit. Can accept different uh, strip heater sizes. May use a common metering device for the indoor outdoor coils. Ductwork must be connected to the unit in this case. Must be insulating the supply and the return ductwork. No exceptions. Controls and components can be serviced from the outside. The nice thing about a package heat pump. Everything is uh, central to the package unit. I've worked on a lot of package units in my career. Uh, package heat pump units tend to be very um, uh, long lasting, a little bit forgiving as far as uh, temperature extremes. Uh, the biggest problem that I find with the package units is improper ductwork connections. Uh, I've had reversing valves go bad in these things. Not very often, thank goodness. Uh, but for the long haul, these um, um, package and heat pumps are a very reliable uh, method of delivering heating and cooling to like say an office as an example. Package air to air heat pump sample installation. So if you have a self-contained unit, basically it could be on a pad on the outside, which is very seldom. Typically these units are going to be mounted up here on the roof. So you're going to have an insulated return duct, insulated supply duct, and in this case here, you're going to have all the ductwork through the crawl space. We're not going to see too much of this here in Southern California. If you go back to the Midwest or to the East Coast, yes. Controls for the air air heat pump. So uh, uh, they must control space temperature, defrost cycle, indoor blower, compressor, outdoor fan, auxiliary heat, and emergency heat at the same time. Two heating systems, one cooling system. 
Auxiliary heating system may be operated as a system by itself if the heat pump fails. Called emergency heat, it's operated only long enough to get the heat pump repair. Remember the secondary heat source, if you have strip heat and if you are consuming kilowatts from the uh, power provider, your watt meter is going to spin at a very high rate. That is a guarantee. About the only thing that you're going to find advantageous with uh, the electric operation is if you happen to live in an area where you have solar uh, as your energy provider during the daytime, like in the southwest portion of the United States, the solar panels, whether it's in the wintertime or the summertime, can definitely uh, make the system very efficient as far as kilowatts that are consumed because you're generating the power right there at the structure instead of buying it from the utility company. Controls for the air to air heat pump thermostat. The space thermostat is the key to controlling the system. Normally a two-stage heating and a two-stage cooling stat is going to be utilized. Number of stages for heating and for cooling may vary. Must have an emergency heat position on the selector switch. Most of the thermostats today are digitally designed. You need to make sure when you're putting in a heat pump system, make sure that the thermostat you're installing has the ability to have a uh, separate heat funk, uh, emergency heat or auxiliary heat uh, switch available to the customer so that they can uh, utilize that heat in the event uh, that the heat pump for whatever reason fails to uh, work properly. Controls for the air to air heating pump, excuse me, air to air heat pumps, cooling cycle control. First stage uh, contacts close when the space temperature rises. Second stage cooling contacts close when the temperature rises about one degrees Fahrenheit. Compressor outdoor fan indoor blower will start. The first contacts open when the temperature falls. Compressor, the outdoor fan, the indoor blower stop and then start again when the temperature rises. So it just operates as a standard thermostat, nothing magical about it. Remember today, the thermostats that you're gonna utilize in this uh, heat pump installation will all be digital. This is a uh, schematic diagram showing a two-stage uh, thermostat in a simplified notice in the first stage. Basically, you have the uh, contacts, this, uh, this symbol here indicates a uh, cooling position as the temperature inside the structure heats up. Then basically once it reaches a set point, that switch will close, okay? That switch will close and of course the four-way valve in this case here, uh, depending on, uh, it will um, energize the four-way uh, coil. All right, and then here, notice that we have a mechanical linkage here to the second stage. So basically what they're doing here, um, you're doing, you're basic, you have the ability to control uh, first stage, second stage. Uh, some heat pumps have a different uh, compression. Uh, you have two compressors, two windings. In this case here, uh, it appears that you're using, you're energizing the uh, four-way valve coil and then you're energizing the uh, cooling uh, because they're mechanically linked. All right, controls for the air, air heat pumps and the second stage of the cooling cycle. So here we have the, uh, uh, basically the first stage, we're going to energize the four-way valve uh, coil and then of course the mechanical linkage uh, internally electronically. Second stage, we're now gonna close this circuit and basically the compressor contactor comes in. So what's gonna happen if you have a two-stage valve? Uh, basically it doesn't necessarily mean two stages of capacity in this case. What we're having here in this case is the first stage we energize the four-way valve on the reversing valve setup. The second stage we actually energize the compressor contactor. Diagram shows what happens when the rise in temperature. First stage thermostats already closed. Second stage closes and starts the compressor. The compressor will be the last on and the first off. So as we reach set point, the compressor drops off and the um, four-way coil still stays energized until the cycle's completed. 
Controls for air to air heat pumps, space heating control. Excessive cold temperatures energize the second stage heat. Second stage heat cycles on and off to uh, assist in the heat pump. Can utilize outdoor stats to control the auxiliary heat. Several stages of strip heat may be applied utilizing the balance points. Remember, when the uh, capacity of the heat pump has been exceeded, then we need to bring on uh, another source of heat. And depending on your location, it'll either be gas or electric. Emergency heat mode allows the owner to start all strip heat if the vapor compression cycle fails. Controls for air to air heat pump, first stage of heat, first stage of heat. Notice that you have same scenario here. Notice that we're not going to energize the four way valve in this case. So on the first stage, we the, the uh, contacts on the upper left hand side are going to close. And then uh, as, the set, as these close, the space temperature drops below the cooling set point for the first stage of heating. Presser starts, this time the four way um, Four-way valve magnetic coil is de-energized and the unit now is in the heating mode. And then, of course, for the second stage, we'll bring on the compressor that we'll see here in the next diagram. Okay, now, in this case here, when the outside temperature continues to fall, it'll pass the balance point or the capacity of the heat pump to extract heat from the outside or the units in defrost, whatever. When the space temperature uh, drops approximately 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, the second stage contacts, the thermostat will close, auxiliary heat contacts will start the auxiliary heat. On your digital thermostats, you'll actually get a notification to the customer that you're now using auxiliary heat instead of the heat pump. And the reason why this is, strip heat costs more to heat a building than the heat pump does. That basically means your watt meter is going to spin faster or uh, you're going to be consuming a lot more power. Okay, in this situation here, we have auxiliary uh, heating contactor, uh, basically the wiring diagram with the outdoor thermostat for controlling auxiliary heat. So in uh, modern heat pumps, we'll have an outdoor control, which will basically automatically send a signal to the indoor thermostat that the temperature is such that we're gonna need auxiliary heat in order to help heat the house up uh, because because of the situation involved where we've reached the balance point or the outdoor unit needs to be defrosted. Notice that both the first and second stages of the uh, thermostat are energized. Now we are bringing on the auxiliary uh, heat contactor coil. And then, to, and usually when you have a uh, strip heat, you usually have two stages, first stage, second stage. Typically, most of the time, first stage should be sized large enough to pretty much carry most of the heating load necessary to the building. And then the second stage uh, will basically ensure that we have enough heat available. But remember, as you energize the first stage, you're gonna consume more power. If you energize the second stage, you're consuming even more power. Controls for air to air heat pumps, auxiliary emergency heat. The space heating control continues. Uh, auxiliary heat, strip heat that operates along with the heat pump, emergency heat, the strip heat that is used instead of the heat pump. Signal light alters the, uh, alters the owner, uh, tells the owner that auxiliary is energized. On your digital stat, you'll have a message that will flash like a red signal saying, hey, you are now utilizing strip heat instead of the heat pump to heat this house up. Must be familiar with the four wiring uh, sequences for a heat cool thermostat. A little bit more involved to wire one of these things. You must know what you're doing. Controls for air to air heat pump, indoor, outdoor, fan control, and heat anticipation. On the new thermostats, it'll all be digital. Indoor fan motor control, the blower must start at the beginning of the cycle, which is controlled by the thermostat. Uh, started with the blower terminal, which is often labeled letter G. Uh, heat anticipator uh, intended to uh, reduce the temperature swing and overshoot often two anticipators on heat pumps and this will typically be done electronically 
In the old days when we still had mercury stats, we had uh, anticipators that we had to set in order to compensate so that the thermostats would not overshoot. Controls for air to air heat pumps, electronic stats, resistor type devices that change resistance with the change in temperature. They're used because they don't use mercury. That's a good thing. Responds faster to temperature changes. That's another good thing. Support the number of features. Troubleshooting similar to troubleshooting older analog or mercury thermostats. Defrost cycle. This is pretty important. Uh, defrost is ice from the outdoor coil during the heating mode. When your unit is operating in a cold climate, the outdoor coil during the heating mode is going to ice up. When the outside temperature drops, the evaporator saturation temperature can drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the outdoor coil starts to freeze. The need to defrost varies depending on the outside temperature and conditions. The more moisture in the air, the more frost that forms on the outdoor coil. If you have dry, uh, cold air, like in North Dakota, or I should say uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, no problem. If you're up in the Pacific Northwest, like uh, Port Orchard, Washington, as an example, you're going to probably have more moisture in the air. That means ice is going to build up a lot faster. Defrosting increases the system efficiency. We want to keep the frost off the outdoor coil in order for that heat pump to work correctly. Defrost cycle, SEER, and HSPF. Now, I'm sure you've heard the term SEER, Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio, the total cooling output for the system divided by the actual power input. That's what that term SEER. Typically in California, we install 14 SEER air conditioning units as the minimum standard. All right, now on heat pumps, we have an additional term it's called Heating Seasonal Performance Factor, HSPF, applies to a particular piece of equipment, breaks the uh, country into six regions, utilized to calculate the operating cost of the heat pump. The SEER and HSPF ratings are a result of federal energy policies. Defrost cycle, how's defrost accomplished? To operate in a defrost mode, the system switches back into cooling mode, the outdoor fan motor de-energizes, not the indoor, the outdoor fan motor de-energizes, the indoor blower remains on, and some auxiliary heat is energized. Demand defrost, defrosting only when needed. Typically in our modern uh, systems, we only defrost the coil when it absolutely needs. This is done electronically through the use of sensors. Factors that vary the operating costs, the number of defrost per season, the length of the defrost and whether the manufacturer tempers the air during defrost with auxiliary heat. Defrost cycle. Initiating the defrost cycle, manufacturers design the system to start defrost when the frost accumulation accumulate when the frost accumulates on the coil. Time and temperature initiated. Look at those terms. Time and temperature initiated. So that means we need to have the correct time of day and the correct temperature performed with a timer today it's all done electronically not with a mechanical timer anymore and temperature sensing device such as a ptc or a sensor common intervals 30 60 90 minutes air pressure switch measures the air pressure drop across the outdoor coil and some heat pumps you'll have an air pressure switch and it will actually sense when the uh, coil is plugged with frost Defrost cycle before the defrost can start. So if you take a look at this electronic timer, here we have uh, L1 and we have L2. That indicates that we have 230 or um, 208 volts. Here we have compressor contactor, terminal Y. There's the O terminal, okay? In this application, the O terminal is going to do what? Energize the four-way valve. In some units, it'll be the B terminal. More about that later. Here we have the uh, uh, defrost relay coil. Here you got the outdoor fan, which is normally closed. And here we have the timer. In this case here, it's an electronic board. Notice that we have terminals four, three, and five. Opens at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. There's your temperature. Closes at 26 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically two things has, have to happen. 
the timer motor has, will have to say it is time to defrost the coil. However, if the temperature is not cold enough, this thermostat will not close, it will bypass, and it will continue to run. But if the timer says it's time to defrost, if the thermostat says it's time to defrost, basically we initiate defrost, we shut down the outdoor fan motor, uh, compressor continues to run, the indoor fan motor continues to run. Now what we're doing is reversing the cycle back to cooling. Now, uh, if it's cold outside, let's say it's 30 degrees outside air temperature, your unit outside is in a defrost mode and it is in the cooling cycle because we have to melt the ice. Well, obviously, we don't want uh, 40 degree air coming out of the registers and dumping cold air into a heated room. So at that point, we will bring on auxiliary heat to temper the air temperature so that we can still take and uh, keep the house relatively warm or the office while the unit is in defrost. Defrost cycle with ice building up. Okay, air pressure switch uh, senses the air pressure drop due to ice buildup on the outdoor coil. Notice that is in the open mode. Notice that the thermostat there uh, opens at 50 degrees, closes at 26. Time to open momentarily after 10 minutes of defrost. Once we take and put the unit in defrost, we have a minimum time uh, that we allow the unit to stay in defrost. We do not want it to stay in defrost for a long period of time. Electronic board has a selector switch that you move a pin or you will set when you are when you are doing the setup on the heat pump and that will limit the amount of time the unit is in defrost during an hourly. Uh, in other words, one uh, defrost cycle an hour uh, maybe one defrost cycle, four hours, depending on the uh, selections that are made when the unit is installed and commissioned. Once again, we have the four-way valve. Notice that we're utilizing terminal O to energize. Here we have the defrost relay coil, outdoor fan motor. Holding contacts hold the unit in defrost until time and air pressure or temperature terminates it. So one device terminates, we go out of defrost and go back into the heating mode, okay? In this timer here, it's time to close for 10 seconds every 90 minutes. So what happens is every 90 minutes, this contacts will close for 10 seconds. Now, this, these other devices are not closed. We're not going to go into defrost. It's as simple as that. <coughs> Pardon me. Defrost cycle, terminating defrost cycle. Uh, stopping the defrost at the correct time is uh, important as starting the defrost only when needed. Demand defrost. Time and or temperature terminated. So either the timer, electronic, or the temperature sensor could terminate defrost. Either condition will terminate. Condition, excuse me, temperature sensors used for defrosting function will open at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 10 minutes is the normal normal maximum uh, time allowed for defrost to take place. Defrost cycle time or temperature termination. There's the timer. There we have the defrost relay coil. And remember, either temperature or time can terminate the uh, defrost cycle. It is time to open momentarily after 10 minutes of defrost. So basically, we'll run for a minimum of 10 minutes. We'll take it out of defrost. And if the switches are still closed, then we'll bring it back on to defrost. If not, the uh, thermostat is saying, hey, the frost is gone. Uh, let's go ahead and continue to heat the structure. No problem. And remember, this electronic timer board is designed to close for 10 seconds every 90 minutes. This board runs 24-7, whether it's in heating or cooling. But if it's in a heating mode, it'll read every 90 minutes in, in this particular situation. The contacts will close for a period of uh, 10 seconds. And so what will happen is uh, if the other switches are not made, we don't go into defrost. It's as simple as that. Electronic control defrost utilizes electronic circuit boards. That's typically what you're going to find on equipment today and their controls mostly uh, more closely control the defrost cycle. 
can accurately control time and temperature with electronic timers and thermistors. Personally, I like the boards a lot better than the old mechanical timers that I got involved with back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, may use the difference in the entering air temperature and the coil temperature to arrive at a temperature split. We utilize other combinations or condition of conditions that include air pressure drop across the coil. Second stage uh, electric heat accomplished with an electric furnace with a heat pump coil for cooling and heating often started with a sequencer which allows a time start and time stop feature. When we're talking about uh, sequencers we do not want all the st stages of strip heat to energize at the same time because this will create a huge demand on the electrical load uh, of the uh, structure. So we have sequencers that will energize the uh, heat strips in stages uh, depending on the need for heat in the structure. Utilizes, uh, it's used for three purposes, supplementary heat, emergency heat, and air tempering. Number of heaters energized depends on the function that they're intended to serve. So whether it be emergency heat, auxiliary heat, or just a tempered air during defrost. Servicing the air to air heat pump. It's much like servicing a refrigeration system during the cooling mode, operates as a high temperature refrigeration system. During the heating season, operates as a low temperature refrigeration system. Servicing of the system is divided into electrical and mechanical servicing. The heat pump may run for days and not stop when the outdoor temperatures are below the balance point. Be aware of that. That's the big disadvantage of a heat pump. If the temperature is below for a period of time, such as a severe storm condition, uh, a cold snap, whatever, the heat pump may operate for a long period of time. One of the things I will say about the uh, mini splits and some of the units that are manufactured uh, for just individual room control, I've seen those things operate down to minus 30 degrees and they do a fantastic job and they still manage to shut off and still heat the uh, struck the room without any problems. Troubleshooting electrical system. Typical electrical problems include uh, indoor blower motor, outdoor fan motor, uh, capacitors. Uh, if the motors are the older PSC styles, always check the run capacitors to make sure they're within 10% of the uh, rated uh, uh, MFD. If not, take them out and replace them. You will not see run capacitors on the new motors that are utilizing what they call the ECM technology, uh, electronically commutated motors. Uh, that's in widespread use now. We also have what they call a constant torque motor, which is a variation of the ECM motor. Once again, you will not see uh, run capacitors on these type of motors because the motors have uh, built-in permanent magnets. Presser contactor, yeah, they do fry sometimes. Uh, fan relays, they go bad. Defrost relay, they go bad. Compressors go bad. Uh, reversing valve solenoid, yep, they go up bad as well. Electric strip heaters and general wiring problems. So these are typical things you're going to find on heat pumps. They're a little bit more involved. They're not bad, uh, but you, once again, you got to know the characteristics in order to, to come up with the conclusions what is working and what is not working. On um, reversing valves, if the solenoid burns out, which it occasionally does, that's an easy fix. If the reversing valve slider mechanism hangs up, which unfortunately happens in older units, you have a major problem because now instead of being able to shift from heating to cooling, it's going to either be in one position or the other, or possibly between both because the valve mechanically uh, uh, failed internally. Unfortunately, this happens not very often, but it does happen. Troubleshooting mechanical problems can be hard to identify with in a heat pump, particularly in the winter operation. Hardest things that you're going to find is trying, how do you charge an air conditioning unit, excuse me, a heat pump unit in the winter when the uh, refrigerant charge is typically going to be about 60 to 70 percent versus the full 100 percent that the unit was rated for in the summertime. Summer operation of heat pump is similar to an air conditioning unit, so that's pretty much a no-brainer. Mechanical problems are solved with gauge manifolds, and I might add electronic gauge manifolds. 
wet bulb, dry bulb thermometers, and air measuring instruments. It's really important you have ducting done correctly on heat pumps. Actually, it should be done correctly in any system, but heat pumps have a tendency to get a bad reputation because the installing contractor did not look at the ductwork issues prior to installing the equipment. And if you did a bad job of uh, not identifying these airflow problems, you could have a very high-end uh, heat pump system and it's basically not going to work as designed because the ducting was not taken into account of the, the different issues that needed to be addressed as far as airflow and teach room, return air, going back to the main unit, that kind of thing. So if the duct works not right, the heat pump's not going to work right. End of discussion. Troubleshooting the four-way reversing valve, common problem, stuck valves. I hate to say it, that is a very common problem. Defective coil that happens once in a while and internal leaks. Check to see if the coil is energized. If you have a heat pump that's not working correctly, the first thing you want to do is see if you've got the 24 volts to the coil, depending on if it's supposed to be energized or de-energized. A warm coil indicates that power is being applied. So you could you know, just do the touch and feel. Place a screwdriver on the coil surface to sense the magnetic field. Remember, on a um, solenoid, basically you have a small winding that's 24 volts that is going to take and energize a steel plunger to take and um, move the solenoid in, at, in the center section. So what they're talking about is putting a screwdriver on the end bell and see if that magnet is uh, working correctly to pull the solenoid. Another way to do it is just to momentarily take an interrupt power to the uh, reversing valve, the 24 volt connection to that valve. And if you hear that distinctive click, typically that means the valve, uh, as far as the solenoid is concerned, is working correctly. Tap the reversing valve with the soft face instrument to see if it'll break loose. Um, I don't want to use the term get a bigger hammer because <laughs> that's probably not appropriate here. Uh, I have seen people get lucky where reversing valves because they are operating in heating mode for a short period of time and the cooling mode 90% of the time. Valves, unfortunately, can and do get stuck. Uh, can you break it loose? Sometimes you can. A lot of times you can't. Change the solenoid coil if it has an open circuit. So if you take and do an ohms reading across the coil and you get infinity, Instead of resistance reading, well, you know what the problem is. Change it out. <laughs> Troubleshooting the four-way reversing valve it has an internal leak. This happens a lot more times than I care to tell you about. Valves with internal leaks can be confused with a compressor uh, not pumping uh, to capacity. This is a common problem out there. Suction pressure will be higher than normal. Discharge pressure will be lower than normal. Check the discharge of the low side line, the suction line from the evaporator and the permanent su uh, suction line between the uh, four-way valve and the compressor. Should be no more than three degrees Fahrenheit. So basically what we're saying, in order to troubleshoot a leaky four-way valve, you need to do uh, contact temperatures uh, sensing. Uh, and basic, based on this slide here, this will tell you if we have a leaking uh, valve. Does this happen? Unfortunately, yes, it does. Is it a pain to change out that four-way valve? Yes, it is. Do you have to pull a refrigerant charge out? Yes, you do. This is a lot of work. I can tell you, typically, if you're changing a four-way valve, you might want to figure on a minimum of five hours. Diagram showing a defective valve. Okay, so here in figure 43.56, the diagram is showing the defective valve and the cooling and heating. So here we have 60 degrees. Uh, we got coming from the indoor coil, 50 degrees. Now notice that we have 60 degrees coming to the compressor. Interesting. Well, what's happening? It's got a leak. Basically, what we're doing, because this valve is not completely sealed off, some of that high pressure vapor is now finding its way in the suction line going to the compressor and adding heat which affects the capacity of this compressor to pump refrigerant vapor. So look at the outdoor temperature of the coil, 200 degrees. Look at the uh, out 
uh, discharge com uh, coming off the compressor, 200 degrees. Well, Larry, how do you know that you got a problem? Well, notice where the thermometers are put, one coming from the indoor coil, another one put on the compressor suction line. If you see more than a three degree value difference, in this case, we got 10 degrees, you know what your problem is, it's that reversing valve, and it has to be changed. Replacing a four-way reversing valve. Make certain the new valve is thoroughly inspected. Make sure the new valve is not dropped or mishandled. They do not take a lot of abuse, folks. Excessive heat has to be avoided when installing. This is a very critical part. And I can't describe uh, through this uh, lesson how to do it. This is something that has to be done with experience. And I will tell you this, uh, only the most experienced people uh, should be attempting this repair. Certainly a homeowner or a rank amateur uh, HVAC novice uh, person may not be able to do this job very well. Excessive heats to be avoided when installing means you have to use the cooling rags, you have to use the uh, heat paste, that kind of thing. New valve is piped in the same mode of operation as the original. The new valve is always installed horizontally. You will never see a reversing valve installed vertically. If you can show me one anywhere out there, I would like a picture of that. An exact replacement part is selected. When you order a replacement reversing valve, don't go to the one-size-fits-all company that has reversing valves for every make and model and not specific to that model. I highly recommend you contact the original equipment manufacturer for their recommendations. There are valves out there that will not work. You need to make sure that you put in the right valve for this application. If you do not, you are going to have problems. A liable test switch will tell whether the compressor is pumping at near capacity. Operate the unit in the cooling mode. Block the airflow until the head pressure is 440 PSIG and the suction pressure is about 118 PSIG with R410A as its refrigerant. Amperage should be close to full load amps. Large inefficiencies indicate that the compressor is leaking internally. Uh, I will say this on heat pumps, the uh, compressors are designed to be more tolerant of liquid because of the fact that you are operating both in heating and cooling mode. The compressors are typically uh, better built uh, they've got more resistance, uh, electrical resistance uh, on the windings. They're just a, uh, uh, they're designed for higher um, coefficient of performance uh, issues. Um, a heat pump compressor is not the same, same as a air conditioning compressor. When you order a replacement compressor for a heat pump, they have their own model uh, designation. So do not think that you can just put a standard air conditioning compressor in a heat pump operation. They will not hold up. They will fail prematurely. Please make sure you put in a heat pump replacement compressor if the original heat pump compressor fails for any reason. Check in the charge. Now this can be difficult. Some heat pumps have a critical refrigerant charge. I mentioned that. Do not install a standard gauge manifold each time you suspect a problem. When a heat pump has a partial charge, leak check the system before charging. Manufacturer may recommend evacuating and recharging. Furnish a procedure for a partial charge. There's no one size fits all service uh, for uh, fixing a system that is not charged properly. Uh, I have worked on heat pump systems that have a small leak. They're hard to find and Typically, I will notice that there is a problem by looking at the outlet temperature in the supply grill. So typically, let's just say as an example, I operate a heat pump, and let's say it's a four-story condominium complex in Beverly Hills, California. And let's say in the heating mode, the design supply temperature should be about 100 degrees, and I'm only reaching 75. Well, that means we've got a problem with the refrigerant charge. Well, how do I know that? Because I told you earlier in the program, we should be seeing close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of that supplier register. So if I were to put my gauge manifold set on the heat pump in the heating mode, 
it will indicate that I do have insufficient refrigerant uh, to make this thing work properly. So what's the solution? Find and fix the leak. You may have to pull the entire charge out, put in a new refrigerant charge, or you could add to it. But the problem is heat pumps have to be charged to a correct pressure temperature relationship, just like the standard air conditioning unit. If you uh, don't pay attention to the charging charts and manufacturer's recommendations, you can overcharge a heat pump and cause them to fail prematurely. Special applications for heat pumps, the use of oil or gas furnaces for auxiliary heat. This is sometimes done. Natural gas obviously is less expensive. Both systems have similar control arrangements. Indoor coil can be used in conjunction with an oil or gas furnace. Must be downstream of the heat exchanger. Control function can be accomplished with an outdoor set set at the balance point of the structure. Once again, you have to know at what point when the outdoor temperature drops when the uh, heating, excuse me, when the heat pump will no longer be able to supply enough heat to the inside of the structure and it has to be supplemented with auxiliary or uh, another heat source in order to maintain the correct temperature inside. Special applications for the heat pumps, maximum uh, heat pump running time. Heat pump is designed to operate whenever it can. Additional controls to stop the heat pump until secondary stat, second stage thermostat contacts satisfy. Heat pumps added to an existing electric furnace. In some old furnaces, the heat pump coil cannot be located for the uh, electric uh, heating elements. I have not seen this. This might exist in some structures, but I've never personally seen this happen. Heat pumps utilizing scroll compressors that typically the compressors of choice today. Remember those compressors are designed for heat pumps, not for air conditioning only. They're ideally suited for heat pump application because of its pumping characteristics. Scroll compressors do not lose as much capacity as a reciprocating compressor. They have, have pressures that are about the same as the reciprocating compressors and, have dis, and are discharge gas cooled. Heat pumps utilizing scroll compressors have other features. They'll have a check valve in the discharge line leaving the compressor to prevent the pressures from equalizing through the compressor during the off cycle or creating what we call a reverse rotation of the rotor, uh, the, the uh, rotating element. Normally, they do not require a suction line accumulator because they're not as sensitive to liquid flood back. Heat pump systems with variable speed motors utilized uh, for the compressor and both fan motors as a method to improve the system efficiency in the heat, heat pump system. They're sized closer to the heating requirements of the structure at full load and will run at partial load and reduce power in the warmer months. Less auxiliary heat is required for these type of systems. Uh, variable speed is accomplished through an electrically uh, controlled motor, ECM, or the constant torque motor design.